understanding the anatomical aspects of uh, jugular venous pulse is extremely important to properly appreciate the observations on jugular venous pulse in the bedside. You can see two diagrams. The picture on the right shows you the deeper findings you expect below the skin in the lateral part of the neck. Let's first identify few important landmarks before uh, explaining how it is actually seen clinically. Now first let's identify the two heads of the muscle sternocleidomastoid or just sternomastoid. It has a medial head which is called the sternal head. You can see that the orange arrow on the bottom shows the sternal head getting inserted into the sternum and next let's identify the clavicular head of the muscle sternomastoid and it is indicated by the red arrow which is shown in the bottom you can see that it is positioned lateral centrally you can see the blue structure which is actually the internal jugular vein an internal jugular vein, as you all know, is the vein which is continuous with the superior vena cava and hence the right atrium, whereas the external jugular vein takes a course through the subclavian vein. Therefore, it doesn't actually directly reflect the pressures in the right atrium. Now, having identified the sternal head and the clavicular head of the muscle sternomastoid, let's define the triangle. The base of the triangle is formed by the clavicle. The medial part of the triangle or the left side of the triangle in this patient is formed by the sternal head. The lateral part of the triangle or the right side of the triangle is formed by the clavicular head. And you can see the yellow arrow indicating the peak of the or the uppermost point of the triangle. So inside this triangle, you can visualize the internal jugular vein. So in a patient who is positioned at 45 degree and neck being slightly turned to the left, not to the extent shown in the diagram, but a little bit lesser. The line which is seen on the, the clinical diagram, which is shown on the right, you can see a slight blue line, the, which indicates the path of the internal jugular vein. So when you position the individual, prep first you will see this triangular part where the pulsation may be seen. And when the pulsation goes above this yellow arrow, then you will appreciate the transmitted pulsation of the internal jugular vein through the muscle sternomastoid. As you can see there, the external jugular vein, which is marked in the diagram on the right side, is more superficial, but it is not reliable to appreciate the waveforms in this particular vein due to reasons which I have already explained. Do view the topic on clinical aspects of JVP to translate the knowledge you have gained on the anatomical aspect for proper understanding and application at the bedside. Juglovenous pulse is perhaps one of the few cardiovascular signs which still has clinical relevance in the era of uh, advanced diagnostics and imaging. It will be nice if you go through the uh, video on anatomical aspects of jugular venous pulse before viewing this video for better understanding of the clinical steps which is going to be explained. Now the first step is to appropriately position the patient at uh, 45 degree as shown in the picture there. The neck has to be completely rested. In other words, the patient should not be holding the neck by themselves or improperly supported by the examiner's hand. Whatever support you give on the back of the neck, still the neck relaxation will not be adequate. So the head has to be comfortably rested on a pillow or in a soft mattress. Then you need to slightly turn the head to the left. Ideal if the head is kept straight, but it may be difficult for you to visualize it going close to the patient. 
so you can gently turn to the left not too much because turning the neck to the left too much will compress the sternomastoid and hence it may actually obstruct the pulsations of the internal jugular vein so the neck has to be slightly turned to the left eliminate and see for the pulsation always this is a principle in cardiovascular medicine pulsations are seen with a tangential elimination as it is shown in the diagram so once you have appropriately positioned the patient head slightly turned to the left and you have eliminated it tangentially look for the pulsation as i have already described in the anatomy video pulsation between the two heads of sternomastoid the triangle which i had shown in the anatomy video now if it is not seen there properly or if a fullness is seen there you can go about and look for the pulsation transmitted through the sternomastoid muscle up to the angle of the mandible so the position actually depends on how how higher is the pulsation higher the pulsation it is sometimes difficult to really appreciate because the triangle will be just full and identify the highest point of pulsation to know the extent to which the jvp is elevated though i am not very much in favor of identifying the type of waveforms in jvp because it has very less clinical value in the era of um, echocardiography as a routine tool used to assess cardiac function it's better you understand the rational behind these uh, waveforms which can be found in the video on jvp waveforms do give your opinion to the email id mentioned there in this video you can understand the waveforms of the jugular venous pulse and its explanation for proper understanding of the contents explained please view the videos on anatomy of jvp and clinical aspects of jvp before viewing this video before explaining the waveforms of the jugular venous pulse let me just explain the activities of the atrium in a real time sequence let me start from the phase of atrial contraction also called the atrial kick which is the last part of the atrial systole so let me start from that which we can call it as a atrial contraction so following atrial contraction as i told which is the later part of the atrial systole there is no blood which is significantly present in the atrium so this phase of atrial contraction is followed by a phase of atrial filling so atrium gets filled progressively like 20% 30% 40% up to a point where the atrium is full which you can call it as a peak pressure in the atrium after the peak filling of the atrium is reached the tricuspid valve opens and the atrium empties into the right atrium sorry right ventricle so this is the sequence so let me just put it over the waveforms and explain you for all practical purposes just remember that you have two positive deflection and two negative deflection in the jugular venous pulse you can forget the c which is a transmitted pulsation from the carotid artery so the first activity which i told was the atrial contraction so when the atrium contracts since there is no proper valves between the right atrium and the continuation of the internal jugular vein a positive deflection is appreciated in the jugular venous pulse mm -hmm. so after the atrium contracts as i already told the atrium gets filled from the internal jugular vein into the atrium so during this phase there will be a flow of blood from the jugular venous pulse into the right atrium this produces the descent in the jugular venous pulse 
as the atrium keeps on getting filled you can see that the descent gradually goes up something like an ascent and when the pressure is maximum we can call it as a peak pressure in the right atrium it produces a smaller positive deflection compared to the a wave which can be called as the v so once this is reached the tricuspid valve opens and emptying of the blood happens into the right ventricle so this again causes a y descent but which is not as steep as the x descent so if you see very carefully the most prominent positive deflection will be the a and the most prominent negative deflection will be x in a healthy individual this slide explains the causes of abnormal waveforms let's start from the a wave of the jugular venous pulse as i told you a is caused by the contraction of the atrium so whenever there is a resistance to the contraction of the atrium the a wave can be prominent so which can naturally occur when there is an obstruction between the atrium and the right ventricle which happens in tricuspid stenosis and worse than what is seen in tricuspid stenosis in hard block atrium will contract against a completely closed tricuspid valve so this can also produce a large a wave which is often called the cannon waves so in tricuspid stenosis and in hard block you either have a completely closed tricuspid valve or a partially to predominantly closed tricuspid valve causing a large a wave now the next situation where you may have a large a wave when there is some amount of impedance in the right ventricle commonly due to right ventricular hypertrophy which may be or may not be due to a pulmonary hypertension so when there is a impedance to the flow of blood from the right atrium to the right ventricle also you can have a large a wave a wave is technically absent in atrial fibrillation but it is more of a theoretical value because you can still diagnose atrial fibrillation without looking at the jvp now when do you have a prominent x descent now in constrictive pericarditis pericarditis what actually happens is that the heart is surrounded by a thick case so it is actually difficult for the blood to enter into the heart since the pressure given by the thick pericardium is high so the only point where the blood will rush rapidly into the right atrium is when the ventricle becomes small you can see in the diagram that x descent happens in the ventricular systole so when the ventricle size becomes smaller the blood suddenly gushes from the internal jugular vein into the right atrium so that causes a prominent x descent in constrictive pericarditis for v wave to be prominent we already know that something should be added more to the right atrium in addition to the peak pressure which is already present so this is possible in tricuspid regurgitation because blood leaks back into the right atrium when the atrium is getting filled up or it is having already a peak pressure so when more blood comes into the atrium when already there is a peak pressure in the atrium you get a prominent v wave in tricuspid regurgitation so y wave descent depends on the volume of blood which goes back into the ventricle because you know that y wave is caused by a flow of blood from the right atrium into the right ventricle so in tricuspid regurgitation there is more amount of blood which is coming into the right atrium every time so naturally more amount of blood will go from the right atrium to the right ventricle causing a prominent y descent so though at an undergraduate level picking up these waveforms are difficult understanding the principles will go a long way for you to properly assess 
when you attempt to postgraduate or wish to learn in more in detail as an undergraduate itself.